And what we have been talking about is that these factors that have to follow from when and how a person is born, who are the um, immediate environment, who are the um, people modeling language in this person's lives, they matter a lot. This is about upbringing. Adhering person putting up this story is about upbringing, is about acculturation, is about raising a person to follow a guide, and she calls it a map, to follow a pathway. Find your linguistic pathway, find your linguistic map, and follow it. And now the question is, if a hearing person can write this of, of a sign language or of sign language, how much more should a deaf person write? How much more? And I, I have continued to tell you that the experience we have had of the deaf persons that we have met in our studies seems to be a little bit different. And this is one thing that is a motivational factor in this series that I've been running because attitude is everything in language from time to time UNESCO will predict of languages that are going to go extinct uh, sometime in 2006 or so um, the prediction was made on my language Igbo and that raised a whole lot of confusion, dialogue, and all that among scholars, users, and all that. Today, some people believe that, I oh, will forget it, Igbo language is not going to die because Igbo speakers are large, not only in, in, in the geographical location called Nigeria, but also beyond that. Others say, oh yeah, Igbo is capable of dying. Why? Because many Igbo people do not um, like to speak Igbo, they speak English. Now, in my experience, both are true. Igbo language is difficult to die. Yet, Igbo language can die. It's all about attitude. So, I will not bore you with um, the linguistic jargon of what it means for a language to be either endangered, critically endangered, extinct, and all that. But the death of a language is not like a one-time thing. It's a gradual process. And it begins with attitude in many cases. Even when there is an imposition of a foreign, a foreign language over a people, what the foreign language does is a gradual depleting of the attitude of the people towards their language. A gradual, subtle, seemingly friendly depletion of attitude. Today, an average Igbo person back home, an average Igbo family wants their children to speak English from birth. Prophets, scholars, what I mean by prophets, I mean um, scholarly prophets, not religious prophets, have been talking about this as a very bad precedence. I've been talking about this as a misnomer. But families, some families who see themselves as at the bourgeois level or elite families or we are rich or whatever, they think it is not necessary. I wish I could produce my videos in, in my language. I wish I could do all of this in Igbo and see have my, my audience, the, the um, expanse of my audience. I can speak Igbo as much as I can speak, my, I can speak English. But for the, the purpose of this recording, um, English seems to be more convenient for the um, audience I am, you know, speaking to. Um, okay, so what I'm saying is, as it applies to Igbo language, as it applies to any language that the UNESCO ha may have had prediction upon as a as a potential dying language, 
so does it apply to any signed language the poor attitude to language is number one is a primary factor towards the death of that language language starts dying from a person into the community language begins to die from inside a person people are saying if evil people do not take care in some years to come their children will lose their linguistic identity totally this is exactly what is going on in the deaf community in so many African countries the introduction of foreign sign languages like ASL like BSL like Portuguese sign language like French sign language LSF all existing existing in African countries today just like English and French these are perpetual death to indigenous African sign languages I keep wondering why scholars international scholars well I don't wonder so much because it is not their primary duty it is not the primary duty of an international scholar to to go and work towards the development of the foreign sign language it is the primary responsibility of the users of that language and what I mean is that when we get, when 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 we have interactions international interactions uh, where scholars you know have to exchange ideas each person will be coming talking from a point of strength and that point of strength is the point of your childhood experience and that childhood experience is something that no one can take away from you and your childhood experience is not complete without your linguistic experience and that linguistic experience only gets to you through acquisition so the attitude of a deaf towards sign language is is a, a holistic embrace it, it is is such that sees a deaf and anybody in that deaf community who is inducted who is indoctrinated into the deaf culture embracing sign language and that's just what it is this is totally different from the attitude of the hearing impaired towards sign language I'm gonna be closing by reading a little bit further into um, Lynette's story and Lynette goes ahead to talk about her mother and Lynette describes how a physician who doesn't use sign language meets her mother her mother is deaf and it was that physician that encouraged her grandmother and grandfather to please send this deaf child to school where she is going to be able to learn sign language in fact ASL and the grandparents of Lynette agreed and sent their mother to school right in their neighborhood there's another deaf woman another deaf girl and the physician also visited them and said please send this girl to school so these two visitations played out in two different ways and had two different results Lynette's mother went to school acquired ASL or learned ASL she was you know beyond five years old but at least got indoctrinated into ASL and became a good deaf signer and became educated and her story became something different the girl in the neighborhood the parents couldn't send to school maybe they don't consider sending her to school and see what Lina said when they died the parents of this girl 50 years later the deaf woman came down from the attic 
she emerged as a feral woman stroke child languageless. She emerged as a woman languageless. She emerged as a child she used to be languageless. That memory seared itself in my language. My mother was acutely aware how it easily could have been her who ended up languageless. She told the story of the doctor who saved her so often that we ended up calling him the deaf angel. Even though he didn't know sign language, he led my mother not only to her language but to life. That is what language does. Language gives life like the air we breathe. Oh, you got me here. Language gives life like the air we breathe. What other be more beautiful way can a person put a story like this? It, it tickles my fancy. What other way could I have described attitude to language? What it does to the language and what language does to you? What other way? There's no other more beautiful way than to put, you know, to put it in the words of Lina Taylor. And that is why I chose to conclude with, you know, this beautiful excerpt. A deaf attitude towards his or her indigenous sign language makes that deaf person a holistically proud deaf person. Makes that language, sign language, a developed sign language. A language that the deaf can reckon with. A language that the deaf can be proud of. A language that the society will see Today, people, deaf people from where I grew up want to identify with American Sign Language without knowing how much effort deaf persons and hearing persons who have been working on that language must have put to get it to where it was, it is today. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't start and end in one day. It is a continued effort. This is a call, this is a call to all deaf persons in African um, continents to work towards the development of your indigenous sign languages. You cannot do without this. That is what it is. You can't. That is who you are and who you are supposed to be. And I want to say, if you can do this, just like Glynette's story about her mother, that's the way you feel. Your language gives you life. It brings back the life that that person may have lost. It, it makes you like feel like you are, oh wow, like the air we breathe. <laughs> I love this story, believe me. All right, today in Indigenous Hands, Indigenous Voices, I've come to the conclusion of the, um, the topic, sign language attitude, deaf and hearing impaired. And I want to continue to urge you to like our channel and share our video. And if you have not subscribed to our channel, go ahead and do. Uh, we are going to be having more exciting moments here because we, we, we are still, you know, warming up to come up with our discussions, descriptive analysis of some indigenous sign languages that have been studying for the past um, years. It's going to be exciting, and I promise you, we will continue to do this. Take care of yourself. Stay home and stop the spread of COVID-19 pandemic. It is real. It is real. Bye.